Hey everybody, thank you very much for joining us here today. And as promised, we have Eric Lawrence, the creator of Fiddler, probably the premier tool in your toolbox if you are a web developer or work with anything protocol driven. Um, welcome to the July or June, I should say, a free webinar from Lidnock. I'm just going to go through some housekeeping before I hand over to Mr. Lawrence. And first up is our sponsor list. There's both Oxford, Telerex, Infusion, Inner Workings, Pluralsight, and Winterlect Now. I want to thank all of these guys and these companies here for supporting us. Uh, we've had support from each and every one of these here for at least the last five to six years. And these are all our premier sponsors. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, if you need to get a hold of anybody from Litnock, it's very simple. You can email us at info at litnock.org. You can catch us on the social. It's twitter.com slash litnock or facebook.com slash litnock. Uh, also, all of our events are recorded, and they are uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is, surprisingly enough, it's youtube.com slash litnock. And our website, uh, you can get it at bit.ly slash litnock. Uh, it's going to undergo some dramatic changes soon. Plus, we also are about to release a Windows 8 and Windows Phone app in the very, very near future. Upcoming events. And July 16th, we have AngularJS, Azure AD, and Office 365 with Sahil Malik, a very well-known uh, Microsoft MVP, and he's very strong in the Office 365 and SharePoint space. And, of course, on August 4th, we have the 18th visit from Scott Guthrie, the GU, the Vice President and Creator of the .NET Framework. He's doing a 90-minute open Q&A, so come along and ask him any question that uh, you fancy. And introducing Eric Lawrence, he is the creator of Fiddler, as I mentioned. He's a Microsoft MVP. He's an avid blogger, and you can catch him on Twitter with Eric Law. And he works full-time at Telerik uh, on Fiddler. A few minor things, asking questions, very simple, open up the Q&A session, type your question in. Quick note, you can only have one question active at any given time. We will clear them out as questions are answered. Uh, if you have a question for any of the Lipnook team, either ping them directly or simply just go to the Q&A and we will pick up on it. Everybody that has Libnock behind our name in here is a Libnock staff member, and they are here to help if you have audio or any other questions. Attendee geography, we actually spread over the entire world. We have two from Australia, pretty impressive. Majority is Central Europe and, of course, North America. Well, with that, I'm going to head over to Mr. Lawrence. Eric, thank you very much for coming on board and uh, presenting Fiddler uh, in 2015 to our members. Great. Glad to be here. Uh, let me switch over decks and get started on my content. Um, so this, this talk is called Fiddler in 2015. Uh, basically, you know, one of the one of the challenges with the Fiddler audience is there are so many different people that are using it for so many different things that I usually give very broad talks about Fiddler. Uh, and you know, one of the things I want to convey with the in 2015 is is that Fiddler isn't the same Fiddler that you know from two or three years ago. Uh, even if you're using it the same way, you know, one of the things I try to strive for is to not break people. But I'm constantly adding new things, and so I want to show off uh, the work that we've been doing. Now, ordinarily, you know, when I talk to a live audience about Fiddler, I kind of pause here and ask how many people have used Fiddler and, you know, how many people know what Fiddler is, how many people have extended Fiddler and questions like that. Um, but, you know, given the, the, the nature of this format and the fact that I think that more people will be watching a recording of this than anything else, uh, I'm just going to go with my default, which is the assumption that many of you have used Fiddler. Uh, some of you have used Fiddler for a very long time. Uh, and I want to sort of re reaffirm that this is a talk that's for all levels. Uh, I, I constantly have people who are new to Fiddler come to these talks, and they're like, wow, this looks great. I can't wait to get started. But even more common is people who say, hey, I've been using Fiddler for the last five years or, you know, ten years even. Uh, and there's a lot of functionality in Fiddler that I just never knew about. 
And so, uh, you know, I hope that you guys all find the same thing and you, you do takeaways uh, from it. Uh, if you have questions, obviously you can use the Q&A tab here, uh, or if you're watching this on a recording, feel free to tweet them to me at Eric Law on Twitter. So I like to tell a lot of backstory about Fiddler just because in addition to the fact that some people kind of find it funny, uh, it also kind of helps set the context of where Fiddler came from and, and that in turn leads to what you can use it for. So I never expected that I was going to be uh, living in Redmond, Washington, driving a car with an HTTP license plate and building a broadly used HTTP debugger. Uh, that wasn't the plan at all. Uh, the plan was I was going to be an astronaut uh, and I, I really wanted to be an astronaut as I was a kid. Uh, and, you know, when I was in my teen years, I actually realized that the other kids who were interested in space and, and becoming astronauts and whatnot uh, were super interested in things like, you know, astronomy and stars and things like that. And I didn't care about that at all. What I cared about was the technology that they were using. Uh, and that's how I kind of pivoted into doing software was the realization that I was way more interested in the computers and the machines than I wasn't interested in anything else. Went to university, uh, got a degree in computer science, and ended up at Microsoft, where my first job was was working on the Microsoft Clip Organizer client. And so I was the guy behind clip art for Microsoft, and I absolutely loved this job. It was a great job because basically, you know, I could tell anybody what I did. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, the pictures of cats and whatever that I throw in my PowerPoint or I, I put on my uh, bulletin board at work, and, you know, people understood it. I wasn't working on, you know, biz talk, soap, internal, XML, you know, things that I couldn't explain to, you know, anybody. And so it was really actually quite a lot of fun. To, to work on this team. The problem is that things didn't always work out. And so when the Office Clip Organizer client failed in contacting the web service, you'd get all these broken clip links where it says dglxasset.asbx, which was the page that was uh, hosting our web service. And debugging this stuff was extremely difficult at the time. Microsoft Net Monitor was out. Uh, it was version 2.0 on the right here. And it just wasn't easy at all for anyone to use, a normal human to use. But the thing that really pushed me over into the edge into writing what eventually became Fiddler uh, was the experience on the left, where I walked into a developer's office, and he was cursing at his, his Visual Studio instance, and I said, well, what are you doing? And I noticed that the tooltip that he was floating over kept, kept going away, and he's like, well, I'm, I'm trying to debug this HTTP request. And I asked him, well, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, if you hover over it, Visual Studio will show a tooltip that shows the octopus hits of the HTTP request, and through that, I'm going to see what was in this HTTP request. And I just thought this was fundamentally absurd, and I knew I could do better than that. And so, you know, I didn't know C Sharp, I didn't know HTTP at the time, but I knew that I could do something better than that. And so what it comes down to is, you know, there's this quote, all problems in computer science can be solved by just adding another level of indirection. And this is true, but in particular it's true for HTTP and HTTPS-based APIs because HTTP has an inherent concept of a proxy. And so you can stick a proxy between a client and a server, and it is expected to faithfully deal with the transactions between those. And so if you build a proxy, you can see everything. And so... I built at first a very simple command line proxy, and that was actually fairly well received. Uh, it, it had a couple of uh, problems, so uh, it would echo everything to the console, so you'd see it. It was not graphical. It was a, it was a console program, uh, and you'd see the HTTP traffic flying by, and we were primarily using this to debug clip art, and so uh, one of the things that helped me gauge the level of interest in my, my little tool uh, was the fact that if you echo binary content to a console, every time that there's an ASCII 7 character, that rings the console bell, and so for for a long time in office, as you walk down the halls, it sounded like a Vegas casino as all the testers' machines were going ding, 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 as clip art flew by. And so that sort of got me into this notion that, hey, this proxy thing is actually working out fairly well. And so I started working on uh, Fiddler in the sort of spring of 20, 2003, and I had my first version uh, for, for broader use available that fall. Since then, it's been about 12 years. Uh, there's now about 35,000 lines of C-sharp in Fiddler, although that's a little bit misleading. I've probably written about 100,000 lines of C-sharp for Fiddler, but uh, as I learn to uh, become a developer, better developer uh, and as I find problems, uh, the code has actually been getting shorter for quite some time. Uh, we've done about 170 release builds. Uh, I've written a full-length paperback book about uh, Fiddler, which is available as an e-book, and now there's a second edition, 
which came out uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, I moved cross country, leaving Microsoft in 2012 to work on Fiddler full time. Uh, and now we have two new supported platforms for Fiddler. Uh, so that's kind of the history of Fiddler. Uh, I'm going to take a quick lap around. So we're going to see if I can successfully share my screen without any, uh, any real disasters. Share all. So uh, hopefully you guys can see my desktop. So we're going to start Fiddler. So this is pretty much uh, what you see for Fiddler. Amusingly, it is showing uh, all of the console traffic for our live meeting session. And I don't really want to see that. So I'm actually going to choose one of the filter options. And I'm going to say, hide all of the traffic from the PW console. Uh, so this is a new feature that's been added to Fiddler relatively recently, which is direct context menu filters. And so they appear down here. Uh, if I right click on this, it's going to cancel that filter. But until I remove that filter, uh, it's just going to hide all of the traffic uh, from that. Fiddler is uh, got on the left hand side what we call the session list. The session list shows the traffic uh, that has been captured by Fiddler. You can see that I actually have a lot of custom columns showing. So ordinarily, you don't have a, a hash waste column or a hash MS fine bloat column or uh, the CE, which is content encoding or security headers. Usually, the first column is the result column showing the results of the, that HTTP request. Uh, but as you do things like I do, so I'm really interested in security, so I want to see what security headers the server is sending. I'm interested in performance, so I want to make sure that my responses are using compression. Uh, and we'll talk about these waste, these waste columns later. But if you want to add your own columns, you can just right click and choose customize columns. And there's different collections, so you can show any request header, you can show any response header, you can show flags about the session, so you can find information uh, about um, the, you know, the client's port or which port the request was sent on, the host IP of the server, whether or not there were protocol violations, things like that. You can show timers. Uh, so basically, Fiddler keeps track of the progress of each HTTP session. And so you can show that information directly in a column. And then my favorite category is miscellaneous. So this is a set of things that I have found useful over time. So you can show the obvious one, which is request method, which should have been in Fiddler's default set to start with. But uh, 12 years ago, I didn't think about it. You can show things like the size of the request, the full size of the response, including the headers, uh, how much you saved by doing compression, uh, security-related headers, a hash of the body, uh, whether or not the request had been sent to a, a gateway proxy, whether or not connections were reused. You can show for images the dimensions of the image or the count of pixels, or interestingly, the number of bytes that are used per pixel. So you can find images that are not well compressed or are uh, sort of abnormally large aspect ratio. Uh, if you want to find images based on color, you can have an RGB shown. If you're trying to find duplicated images, uh, you can use the image fingerprint, which will do both the uh, size and uh, the RGB. And then you can also have even a geolocation column. And so what this does is for every JPEG that flows by, it looks to see whether or not there's information about where that image was taken. And sometimes this can be surprising. You'll find that people fail to strip out their geolocation information for images that they post. And so sometimes uh, there's some using things. There were a couple of years ago, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, um, John McAfee was hiding out in Bolivia and, you know, he was on the run and didn't want anybody to know where he was, but he let a journalist take a picture of him uh, with his iPhone. And when they uploaded that picture to the magazine, uh, they had failed to strip out the geolocation information. And so that would actually appear in a column here in Fiddler. But so the, the, the session list is the primary way that people interact uh, with things in Fiddler. So if I just open a, a trivial website, you know, this website here, you're going to see, you know, your set of traffic that's appearing here. Uh, one of the features that is uh, relatively new to Fiddler but is super powerful is the ability to alt-click uh, within any column, and it will highlight all of the things that have a matching value in that column. And so I've alt-clicked in this www.baden.com column, and it's 
finding everything that matches that. Or if I want to find everything that has a 304 response code, I can alt-click there. Or if I want to find all the images, I can just alt-click on this image icon, and it's going to find that, or the post icon, and it's going to find all of that. And so this is a very quick way of interacting with things. So if I say, hey, actually, I don't care about anything going to, uh, you know, a tunnel, I can just select those and then hit delete. Or if I only care about something, so I only care about traffic to Baden.com, I can select it, and then I can click shift or hold shift and click delete, and it'll delete everything except what I've selected. And so filtering traffic in the session list uh, is a very powerful feature for, for getting to what you care about quickly. On the right-hand side of Fiddler are a broad set of tabs. By far the most common one is the inspectors tab. And so you can see here, Fiddler has inspectors uh, that show the request in any number of formats and the response in any number of formats. These are fully extensible. Every single one of these tabs uh, can be provided by an extension. And so if there's something that your organization uses uniquely, maybe you're using uh, one of the web services uh, SOAP encodings that does you know, some kind of crazy scheme of base64, gzip encoded, blah, 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 XML, you can actually write a decoder for that. And for many common formats, uh, there's already encoders out there on the web. Uh, and decoders, and so you can find some of those on the Fiddler add-ons page. Um, but so you have your request inspectors on the top, your response inspectors on the bottom. There's a million other tabs in Fiddler. Uh, there was a joke a while ago, so Telerik makes a bunch of free products called like Just Code and Just Trace and Just Decompile and so forth. And so for April Fool's Day a few years ago, someone had proposed Just Tabs uh, because Fiddler has lots of tabs, tabs nested within tabs and so forth. Uh, and the, the tabs in Fiddler, uh, the way to think about it is any place that you see a tab, there's a pretty good chance that you can put your own tab there. And so, for instance, one of the things that came up recently was there's this new security standard for including hashes of JavaScript or CSS in your page. So if you're pulling your content from a third-party service, but you want to ensure that it hasn't been modified at all, you can include an integrity hash. Well, I made a tiny little integrity hash tab here where basically you select your resource and it will automatically compute the SHA-256, SHA-384, and SHA-512 hash for that. You can just go copy and paste that into your markup. And so extensibility really is what Fiddler is about. If you remember at the beginning, I was talking about how Fiddler sort of came about as a tool for debugging clip art. Well, you can still debug clip art with Fiddler, but you can obviously go way beyond that. And one of the reasons that you can go way beyond that, of course, is that Fiddler is designed to uh, support extensibility in virtually every important way. So if we're going to go pivot back to our content and see whether or not make sure that that works uh, properly. Go back to our deck. Make sure it doesn't crash. Great. Uh, and we'll, we'll flip back to, to sort of live code uh, soon, but uh, I wanted to show off some of the things. So I, I showed already sort of the alt-click ability to select content. Uh, you can very quickly mark content in the web sessions list. So you can, after you've selected one or more sessions, you can hit Control-1 through Control-6 to actually choose the color. So you see the, the red, blue, yellow, green, orange, purple uh, on the right-hand side uh, just by clicking Control-1, Control-2, Control-3, and so forth. You can select all of the items that have been so marked using Alt-1, Alt-2, Alt-3, Alt-4, Alt-5, Alt-6. And so you can very quickly interact with content in that way. Uh, and then on the, the very bottom of the right-hand side, I show Fiddler has a, a lot of functionality uh, available via the keyboard. And so if you select the session in Fiddler's session list and hit V, what it'll do is it'll do a verify operation where it'll resend the same request and then determine whether or not the response body differs at all. And so this is perhaps the most lightweight way of API testing uh, in Fiddler. Uh, but similarly, you can push the R key, and it'll, it'll simply reissue the request. If you push the U key, it'll reissue the request unconditionally. All of these keyboard shortcuts uh, you can see by right-clicking uh, in the sessions list and, and looking at the context menu. Uh, they're all exposed there. Uh, but Fiddler's session list is, is certainly the most powerful part of its UI. Traffic monitoring is the key scenario for Fiddler. So the typical architecture here is you've got your application and you've got Fiddler sitting between your application and any upstream proxy 
uh, and then going out in the firewall and, and, and going out over the Internet there. There are many different HTTP stacks. Windows uses WinINet and WinHTTP primarily, but there's also System.net for the, the .NET framework. You've got Java. You've got Firefox, which includes its own HTTP stack. You've got other things like Chrome, uh, which, which obviously includes its own HTTP stack. But most things in Windows will actually directly send their traffic to the system registered proxy for WinINet. And so most things will automatically send their traffic to Fiddler. But if they don't automatically send their traffic to Fiddler, almost everything can be configured to send its traffic to Fiddler. Because uh, if you can't, if your application doesn't support a proxy, then it becomes very difficult to sell it to any kind of enterprise. And uh, that for that reason, most of the frameworks inherently support the notion of proxies. Uh, one of the sort of interesting things that's come up recently is Node.js. So more and more people are building things in Node, and they want to hook things with Fiddler. Well, one of the challenges with Node is there's probably 50 or more HTTP frameworks available for Node.js. And for some of them, it's very easy to set a proxy, and for others, some more trickery is required. But with virtually all of them, it's possible. One of the very interesting scenarios enabled by the fact that Fiddler acts as a proxy, however, is the fact that you can also use it to debug across devices. So you can run a Fiddler instance on Windows or a Linux uh, machine or technically on OS X, but I wouldn't recommend it. But Fiddler or Linux, uh, whether it's a real machine or a virtual machine, and then you can point your phones, your tablets, your iOS devices, your Mac uh, devices, or other PCs at that Fiddler instance. Uh, and as long as you've configured Fiddler to be allowed through the firewall, those, those uh, devices, if they're on the same Wi-Fi network or are hardwired, uh, can send their traffic to Fiddler. And so uh, you can debug almost any device uh, through Fiddler. In the worst case, you can use Fiddler as a reverse proxy, which means that you stand Fiddler up on your server, and you just put Fiddler running on port 80, and you configure Fiddler to port uh, to push all of its traffic to a different port. And so this is the scenario where, for whatever reason, you absolutely cannot change the client in any way, and you can't run on the client. And so in this scenario, basically, Fiddler becomes your web server and starts pushing your traffic into your real web server. Uh, generally speaking, I don't recommend this approach. Uh, it obviously has some scalability concerns, and you certainly shouldn't do it in production. It works fine for tests, but you shouldn't do it in production, although I do know that some low-traffic sites actually have done this in production. One of the changes that was made in Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 is that Metro style or immersive applications cannot send their traffic to the local machine. They did this as a security attack surface reduction, but it has the side effect that they cannot send traffic to Fiddler. So on the left-hand side of Fiddler's toolbar, there's a button called Win8 Config. You can click that button once, and it'll open an exemption utility, which you see on the right-hand side. If you control-click that button, it'll launch the utility, but not actually force you to manually do anything. It will just automatically give everything on your machine an exemption. From a security point of view, this does slightly increase your attack surface. But really, the design here on Microsoft's part was to prevent applications from being able to reliably expect to be able to communicate to the local PC. And the reason that they did this is application platforms that did not have this type of protection usually have a very easy way to jump out of a sandboxed app into native code running at full trust and compromising the device. And so Microsoft made this decision. Uh, but you can easily uh, subvert the decision using using the Win8 config button on, on Fiddler's toolbar. Uh, this will also become important with Windows 10, the Edge browser, the replacement for Internet Explorer, runs inside an app container. And so you'll need to use this to capture your traffic from the Edge browser on Windows 10. For .NET applications, most of them will automatically pick up a proxy setting, but if they don't, you can edit your apps.exe.config file or the machine config file and point the proxy address at Fiddler, which runs on 127.0.0.1 on port 8888. The one caveat here I would say is that if you do this inside your machine config, do not forget that you did it. One of the most common support requests I get from .NET developers is, hey, after I debug my application with Fiddler, my application doesn't work unless Fiddler's running. What went wrong? And the answer is, well, you're telling your application to send all of its traffic to Fiddler, so it's only going to work if Fiddler is there. And so you do have to be careful if you use this, uh, use this option to route all of your machines.net traffic through Fiddler.
I mentioned previously Node.js has different approaches for different uh, uh, different HTTP libraries. Here's one approach where basically uh, you make your path the fully qualified URL, but you set your host and port to point at Fiddler, and so you can send your traffic through Fiddler uh, in this way using Node.js. Python and things like that have similar approaches. Fiddler runs now on Linux. Uh, Mint and Ubuntu are the two that I tested on. Uh, it has near feature parity uh, Fiddler on Windows. It runs on the Mono framework. So in order for this to work, you have to install Mono on your Linux machine, uh, and then you can grab the Fiddler bits. Uh, I say near feature parity. There are a couple of differences. Scripting in the Mono version is using C Sharp as a scripting language rather than JavaScript.net because the Mono guys looked at JavaScript.net and rightly felt that it was an abomination and they didn't bother porting it, uh, but uh, you, you can do C-sharp-based scripting. Currently, our Fiddler builds for Mono are significantly behind Fiddler for Windows. Uh, I think the last build was in, in December, but we're planning on building a new one, and we're also going to start gathering some telemetry that might uh, help us make a case that we should be updating these more often. Uh, but certainly, this is an available option, and this is, in fact, the recommended option if you're going to run Fiddler on OS X, uh, put it in a Linux virtual machine or a Windows virtual machine using VirtualBox or, or Parallels and things like that. Um, technically, there is a build of Fiddler that you can run on Mono on OS X, but unfortunately, the Mono port on OS X, the UI framework is not very good, and so you will find that the UI frequently has problems repainting and things like that. We are profoundly aware of the fact that people would like Fiddler to run better on OS X, and so this is an area of ongoing investment and investigation as we determine how we want to move forward with that. Uh, but for now, the recommended approach is to use a virtual machine and, and just put uh, Fiddler uh, running on Windows or on Linux in that virtual machine. And then you can use uh, your Mac's proxy settings to point to that virtual machine, and so your Mac traffic flows through the VM before it goes out on the network and this works pretty well. Protocol-wise, uh, Fiddler supports HTTP, obviously. It supports HTTPS traffic decryption, so this is something that, you know, basically it's performing a man-in-the-middle attack on your traffic. And the reason that this works is Fiddler is able to generate new certificates for sites and uh, return those uh, to your computer. And your computer can be configured to trust Fiddler's root certificate so that when it goes out and says, hey, wait, this certificate was issued by Do Not Trust Fiddler root, it will consult the Windows certificate store and say, do we trust that? And if you've chosen the option to do so, uh, the client will say yes. Some people worry after, uh, you know, things like the Superfish debacle and other HTTPS interception things that have been happening this year, hey, is it safe to do this with Fiddler? And the answer is yes, it is significantly safer than any of those things that you've heard about. And the reason is Fiddler generates a new root certificate for every machine that it runs on. And so, yes, you can get the private key of Fiddler's root certificate for your machine, but that doesn't give you the ability to do anything interesting against any other machine. And so it is relatively relatively safe to have Fiddler's root certificate trusted on your own machine. If someone were to try to abuse that certificate, they would already have to have effectively admin permissions on your machine, and if they can do that, they don't really need to do anything else to you. Uh, screenshot on the left-hand side actually is the first time that I had used HTTPS interception in Fiddler. This is around 2006 or so. I, I uh, had somebody in my office while I logged into my Fidelity account and, you know, showed some ridiculous balance. And they, of course, had, had no idea that Fiddler had the capability of doing automated traffic rewrites for HTTPS traffic. And so they were very sad when they learned that I wasn't going to go buy them a boat. FTP support is supported in Fiddler. Uh, it's off by default, but if you have an FTP client going th or an FTP URL in your browser, uh, browsers can be configured to proxy their FTP traffic over HTTP, and that's what Fiddler takes advantage of. Uh, but it's off by default. The most interesting new protocol is uh, HTTP2, uh, also speedy, and that should be 2, not 2.0, since they decided they don't support minor versions anymore. Um, but uh, speedy and HTTP2 require a particular 
uh, field to be in the HTTPS handshake. And currently, the .NET framework does not have the ability to send that field. It's called ALPN, or Application Layer Protocol no Notification. Uh, that's something that I'm hoping will be added to the SSL stream class in the future. And once it is, Fiddler can be uh, can take advantage of that, and then I can start building HTTP2 support within Fiddler. Having said that, while it's interesting to debug HTTP2, essentially all services will fall back to HTTP 1.1 if the HTTP 2 handshake doesn't take place. And so that means that you can still safely debug your traffic with Fiddler. You're just going to see slightly different characteristics in terms of how that traffic behaves uh, when HTTP 2 is not in use. But this is something that I am very eager to see the .NET team uh, invest in. And there's a bug on Connect and User Voice requesting that the SSL stream support ALPN. And so it would be great if you guys could weigh in and uh, agree with me that that should be a priority for them. Fiddler does keep track of the use of the protocols, and so when it finds things that violate the HTTP protocol, it will complain about them. Some people find this super helpful. Some people find it super annoying. Some people who find it super annoying would find it super helpful if they knew what they were looking at. So Fiddler, by default, will warn about serious problems, uh, things that are considered basic to HTTP, like having a valid content length so that a proxy or intermediary or client can know how long the content it's downloading is. Uh, but there's also extended checks, which you can turn on. The extended checks are there because they will flag problems in use of the protocol that are more obscure but might cause problems with clients. And so sometimes people will say, hey, my site or service isn't working. Why isn't it working? And uh, I say, hey, do you have protocol violation reporting turned on in Fiddler? And they say, no. And I say, turn it on. And so they turn it on, and they load their page, and they immediately get a pop-up box saying, hey, you know, you did this wrong. And they say, oh, well, geez, that was easy. The challenge is it tends to be pretty noisy. So many sites make rather innocuous mistakes, like omitting a date response header or using a relative location header and things like that. Uh, and so this list can get pretty long. But it's definitely a good thing to have turned on when you're visiting or testing your own site specifically, because it will tell you about places that you've done things wrong. HTML5 introduces this concept of web sockets, which is a bi-directional communication over sockets. Uh, let's actually go switch, and we're going to go switch and take a look at that, because uh, why not? So we're going to switch back to our, our thing here, and we're going to go to httpwebsockets.test.com. And you can see this is a, just a simple HTML5 web socket test page, and you can see that uh, Looks like pretty good support uh, in this browser here. Uh, but over in Fiddler's session list, we have uh, these WebSocket icons. And when you double click on a WebSocket in current versions of Fiddler, it will open and add a new tab called WebSocket. Uh, which shows the messages that are being retrieved and sent on that WebSocket. And so you can see, uh, if you select one of these messages, you can look at it as text. You can look at the hex values. If it were JSON, you could look at the JSON values. Um, but effectively, this allows you to examine WebSocket messages uh, inbound and outbound, uh, just as if they were normal HTTP traffic. If, uh, for instance, you had a, a WebSocket uh, that returned, you know, a binary, a piece of binary content, like an image directly that was being manipulated by your JavaScript for display to the user, there's not currently a WebSocket inspector for that. But what you can do is you can click this Inspect as Response button. And when you do this, it takes the body of that WebSocket message, and it generates a phony response uh, in the Fiddler main web sessions list, which you can then investigate using all of Fiddler's inspectors. And so that's a very powerful way to examine traffic uh, in, inside uh, a WebSocket with Fiddler. So that's basically kind of what we're showing with WebSockets. Uh, there's also, if we click in the rules, customize rules, we can open Fiddler script. And if we search for web socket message, oh, did I not have it? Oh, 
apparently this is an older script that doesn't have my, my WebSocket message handler, but uh, there's an on WebSocket message handler that you can do. So uh, I think I have sample script over in my slide deck, so we'll switch back to it. Uh, but you can, you can effectively interact with WebSocket messages just like they were HTTP messages. You get an event handler called on WebSocket message that passes you a WebSocket object, uh, WebSocket message object that you can manipulate. So you can see on the right-hand side, we have timer, comma, dot, 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 bazinga. Well, what's happened is I've just written script that on every message that it starts with the word T-I-M-E, uh, it appends dot bazinga. And so you can modify inbound or outbound traffic. Uh, beyond displaying this traffic in Fiddler, it is preserved in Fiddler session archive files, the SAS files. And so you can reload uh, WebSocket messages that have been captured on your own machine or someone else's machine for future investigation and inspection. Yeah, here's my, my sample application here. I, you know, I threw it in the log tab just for, just for fun. Uh, but also I say, hey, take the payload as if it were a string. If it contains T-I-M-E, then set the payload to be the payload plus the trailing string Bazinga. And this happens on both inbound and outbound messages. But the O message, this WebSocket message object, has an inbound property, so you can determine whether or not it's going uh, in or out. I mentioned the SAS file format previously, but this is Fiddler's native file format. They contain the request and response body bytes. They contain timing and other metadata. They contain all the WebSocket messages, and they contain an HTML index file. And so if you rename a Fiddler.sas file to .zip and extract it to your desktop, you can actually go pawing around in there, open the index file, and look at a very basic HTML view of the traffic. So that can be useful if you're running on a machine that doesn't currently have Fiddler installed. Uh, you can encrypt SAS files. You can assign them a password, and this is highly recommended if you've got any kind of personal data. So if you've got, you know, your bank information, or even if you just had your bank open, you weren't specifically looking at your bank, but some of that traffic got captured by Fiddler while you were looking at something else. Uh, it can be useful to encrypt your, your content using uh, a password so that other people can't open it. This is particularly recommended, obviously, if you're going to go share it on Dropbox or something else. A uh, key aspect of the SAS file format is it's containing everything. It's containing, you know, your session cookies. If you typed into a password form that has, uh, that's sending your password to the server, all of that data is in there. So if someone asks you for a SAS file, make sure that there's someone you trust or that you very carefully go through and eliminate any of the sessions that have information that that person shouldn't see. If you're building an application, you find Fiddler to be super useful and you really wish you could get session archive files from your customers, there's an easy way to do that. It's called Fiddler Cap. If you go to fiddlercap.com, you can have users download it. Basically, the, the uh, UI is significantly simpler than Fiddler itself, and it's even deceptive because it's simpler than it looks. Basically, on the left-hand side, you've got start, stop, and save, and that's what most users are going to be using most of the time. You know, they click start, they go do whatever is broken, they click stop, they click save, they save that content to a file, they send you that file, and then you can actually go look at that traffic directly on your computer. The user interface for this tool is localized into French, Spanish, Portuguese, I think that's simplified Chinese, and uh, looks like Russian. Uh, so you can collect this data from a lot of different uh, locales uh, and, and use it within your debugging process. Fiddler can import traffic from many different formats. Perhaps the most uh, common one is HTTP archive format. So these are uh, JSON files containing HTTP traffic that can be emitted by Chrome's developer tools, by Firebug, uh, the developer tool. Uh, IE F12 developer tools use uh, what's called NetXML, which is basically just an XML version of the HAR file format, but the new upcoming Microsoft Edge browser will use the HTTP archive format directly. You can also import more obscure formats like Test Studio's load test format. Uh, and if you have uh, low-level network engineers on your side who are using something like Wireshark or TCP Dump or NetMon or tools like that, you can collect those .cap files or .pcap files and 
and Fiddler can import the unencrypted traffic from them. Now, that is a key distinction. It can only import unencrypted traffic, so basically HTTP requests. It can't do HTTPS because when Wireshark or NetMont sees that traffic, it's already been encrypted and the bytes are meaningless to Fiddler. You can also write your own importers. You can write your own importers using uh, C Sharp or any other .NET language and have the traffic appear within Fiddler. So you could conceivably even create, you know, something that would import like an IAS log file and generate uh, simulated traffic that is loaded into Fiddler. Uh, and, you know, if you've got any kind of preservation format, Fiddler could be, could be put into service to display that data. So this is on the left-hand side, a capture of Grand Theft Auto talking to the server uh, out at Rockstar Games. And so we've imported that cap file into uh, Fiddler on the right-hand side. And you can see, you know, the JSON content that the Rockstar Games server is sending out to the Xbox. Uh, so it's kind of a cool feature. Output-wise, the native format is the Fiddler Session Archive, but you can also export to Visual Studio web tests. You can generate HTML5 app cache manifests. You can generate the IAS WCAT tools load tests. You can generate curl scripts. You can export HTTP archive format. Uh, you can copy, you know, sessions to clipboard. You can save as plain text. You can dump all the response bodies to disk. Uh, you can archive content to a database that's also extensible. So, you know, here's an example of, you know, a, a tab separated value. Uh, exporter. It's very simple. There's effectively one interface, session exporter, one method, export sessions, uh, that gives you kind of everything you need in order to generate uh, exported data out of Fiddler. So if you have any kind of uh, scenario where it would be, you know, helpful to pull your data into some other system you have, you could also just, you know, your exporter could really just be dumping uh, the session traffic into database, and that would work just fine. There's no requirement that it actually be a file. Analyzing traffic with Fiddler. Certainly, Fiddler includes a lot of filtering features, and sometimes it's confusing how many fi filtering features Fiddler offers, but there's a reason for it, which is there's a lot of HTTP traffic going on, and very often you don't really want to see all that stuff. So there's built-in filters on the rule menu for ignoring uh, images and connects. You can do application type filters, so down within Fiddler's status bar, you can switch between browsers, non-browsers, remote clients, things like that. You can do a process-specific filter, so uh, you can use the uh, um, the site, the gun site uh, icon on Fiddler's toolbar, drag that to a program, and it will capture only traffic from that program, hiding it otherwise. Uh, and as I showed earlier, you can also right-click on a session, choose filters from the context menu, and either exclude or include that process in the capture so that you can uh, directly uh, interact filters on traffic. One of the most common problems that people report with Fiddler is, hey, I'm not seeing some traffic that I expect to. And I'll ask them, well, do you have any filters set? And they say, well, no, of course not. Uh, and the answer is, actually, you do. They just forgot about it. And so on the help menu, there's a troubleshoot command. If you click the troubleshoot command on the help menu, uh, you'll see some diagnostic information. But one of the other things that will happen is while that, that troubleshoot uh, menu item is checked, Fiddler will unhide but strike through anything that would be hidden. And so you can reproduce your problem and see whether or not the traffic really isn't getting to Fiddler at all or if it's been hidden by a filter. And if it's been hidden by the filter, the comments column in the Fiddler session list will tell you which, fi which Fiddler filter hid that traffic. And so you can say, oh, status bar process filter. Oops, I forgot that I had it set to non-browsers, and that's why I'm not seeing traffic from Chrome. Selecting traffic, there are many different ways to select traffic. So previously I showed how you can alt-click within a column to select traffic, but you can also use uh, features like the quick exec box. I, sh I love showing off the quick exec box because most people have never seen it or they've seen it, obviously, but they don't know what it means. Down here, there's this box, Quick Exec. The Quick Exec box allows you to do many different commands. You can do things like find responses that are greater than 4K. You can do things like find responses that are smaller than 20K. So you can do things based on what the HTTP method is. That selected all the posts. Or I can say uh, I can find traffic that is going to ie.microsoft.com. 
and it's going to find things that are related to ie.microsoft.com. So this is a super powerful way to select traffic. You can type help in the quick exec box to learn more about the automatic selection mechanisms that are available here. But usually I do things that, you know, very basic operations like select image. It's going to select all the images. So there are a ton of features there, and this is fully extensible. So you can add your own methods if you want. So if you've got logging calls that are, you know, always to a particular service, you could just, you know, introduce a new quick exec command called, you know, like all logs that finds all the log commands and selects them or hides them. The other mechanism of finding traffic is on the edit menu, you can do find sessions or you can hit control F. And so the find sessions dialog allows you to find specific things. You can do a regex if you want by typing regex colon uh, or checking this regex box here. You can search within requests, responses, requests or responses, or only in the URLs. You can look in the headers and bodies, headers or bodies only. You can decode compressed content. You probably want to do this because your server, if it's behaving properly, is probably doing gzip or deflate compression on content. Uh, you can search only the selected sessions if you want. You can select matches. You can choose the color that you want to select matches. It's a very powerful feature for finding traffic. Uh, and once you've selected that traffic, you can delete all the other traffic if you like by, by hitting shift delete while the focus is in the session list. So switching back to the deck. Regular expressions are supported pretty much uh, in most places in Fiddler, usually with the prefix regex colon. Uh, so within the search of the syntax view extension, within the find sessions box, within the autoresponder, regex colon will allow you to uh, find things using a regular expression. Let me look to see real quick. There's a Q&A thing. Uh, well, I support C Sharp scripting on Windows as well. Uh, so the short answer is sure, why not? Um, there's no reason why Fiddler doesn't support uh, C Sharp scripting on Windows, uh, except for the fact that at the time that Fiddler was originally written, uh, it was targeting the first, uh, the .NET Framework 1.1, and there was not a code DOM provider, I don't think, at that time, or it didn't work properly, or it didn't understand how to make it work properly. So, uh, yes, you could certainly have a C Sharp uh, based script provider. You should probably send me mail, just click help send feedback, and I'll point you to it. I've done it previously for, I think, Python. Uh, somebody wanted Iron Python, and so I put together a DLR-based uh, script provider. Uh, but doing uh, C-sharp scripting is just fine. The reality is that uh, JavaScript.net is extremely close to C-sharp. There's some sort of, you know, little syntactic sugar around it, but it's, it's quite similar. And so even though I don't write any meaningful amount of JavaScript day-to-day, uh, -day, I, I manage to get by. Uh, but C-sharp script might be more convenient for some people, and so I can, I can help you with that. When comparing traffic in Fiddler, uh, you can select any two sessions, uh, right-click them, and choose Compare. So this is very useful uh, if you've got something, you know, if you've got a SAS file that you got from a customer that doesn't work, and it does work on your machine, you can load their SAS file, you can do the repro on your machine, and then you can select those two sessions and choose compare, and it will compare the requests and responses to understand what went wrong or what's different between those two captures. Uh, by default, I try to find WinDiff uh, and use it, but you can point this at odd, beyond compare, win merge, pretty much any diff tool can be used. And you can configure the diff tool in Fiddler's uh, tools, uh, options, tools screen. So you can do it uh, through that. If you need to compare more than a single session at a time, the way to do it is to use the traffic comparison or the differ extension, which is available from the Fiddler downloads, uh, the add-ons page. Uh, within the differ extension, you can load a SAS file on the left, a SAS file on the right. It will identify things that are identical and strike them out. Uh, and then things that are not identical, it will show. And so you can actually compare, uh, select one on the left, select one on the right, and choose compare. And it will find out what's different between those sessions. So if you don't know what specifically went wrong with the user loading your website, you would use this. And you could say, hey, actually, it looks on, like on uh, the customer's machine, uh, they failed to load this JavaScript file. And so that's why this, this is likely failing. And so that's a, a powerful mechanism for doing uh, broader, uh, broader comparison. The text wizard. 
So very often when you're interacting with content on the web, it's been encoded in some way, whether it's uh, in base64 encoding, like the string at the top, or, you know, it's been URL encoded, or uh, it's been encoded as a JavaScript string, or even a more obscure format like deflated SAML, uh, which is sometimes used with WCF. Uh, Fiddler has the ability to convert between encodings. Uh, and if you want to generate, you know, if you've got a C-sharp client, for instance, you're building and you want to emulate what a JavaScript program was sending to the server, you can do things like generate a C-sharp byte array out of a piece of content that had been captured, and then you can use that C-sharp byte array declaration within your, your C-sharp client to actually emulate that. You can chain encodings by using the send output to input button which does literally what it says. It takes the output, throws it up in the input field, and then you can select a different transform to apply. And if you want to inspect the results of that using something other than this text viewer, you can click the Save Output to As Session. And when you click the As Session link, it generates a fake session within the Fiddler session list. So you could use something like, if you had a data URA, for instance, uh, you could use that data URA. You can inspect it as a um, uh, using the image inspector in Fiddler. The Syntax Viewer extension is by far the most valuable extension for Fiddler that is not installed by default. It's not installed by default because it's a little bit large. It's about 750K, which I guess in today's universe isn't that much, but Fiddler itself is only about a megabyte. Uh, so I didn't want to have to download that every time you download Fiddler. Uh, but there's a Get Syntax View tab uh, on Fiddler uh, by default because I really want you to have this thing. And that's one of the ways that I determine how serious a user of Fiddler you are. If you've clicked the Get Syntax View button on that tab, then I know you've poked around a bit. But if I still see Get Syntax View within your tab list, then I know you're probably not using Fiddler as effectively as, as you could be. And so I try and evangelize that pretty hard. So one of the things that I've become super passionate about over the past few, well, years, I guess, is web performance. And one of the most interesting things in web performance happened rather quietly around 2013, and that was the addition of a tool called Zopfly. Zopfly is a gzip compressor written by some compression experts who work for Google. And the way that gzip and deflate compression work, and so gzip is actually just a special case of deflate compression, uh, the way that they work, you can generate uh, compression ratios that vary wildly. So if you're going to do a very naive, very fast compression, you can get poor compression. Whereas if you do a crazy complicated and expensive and CPU intensive compression, you can get much better compression. Unfortunately, a lot of the things that we should be spending gobs of CPU resources to maximize compression, we don't. And so we're missing a huge opportunity to save massive amounts of bandwidth. Well, Fiddler now has the ability to show you that directly within the UI on the Transformer tab. The Transformer tab now has a checkbox for using Zoffly compression. So if we go over and we find a likely candidate, like websocketstest.com, let's see whether or not that was compressed at all. No, that wasn't. Let's find something that was. Okay, here's a great example, right? We've got... Google APIs, uh, this is prototype, so prototype a JavaScript library. If we go to Fiddler's uh, Transformer tab, you can see that this is a 31K, 31718 bytes delivered. And if we look down at the bottom, we can see the original was 139,854. So we got a 77.3% compression ratio, which is awesome. And we can further see that the, the compressor is claiming that it did its best. It wasn't in, you know, fast mode or things like that. But in Fiddler, we have this checkbox that says, use Zopfly. And so what this is going to do is it's going to recompress the content using Zopfly. So, you know, we're trying to beat 31,718 and 77.3%. And so we got it down to 29,946, and our compression ratio went up to 78.6%. So we saved a couple of kilobytes, which may be huge, because you've got to think that this Google library is probably being delivered a million times a day. 2K times a million times a day, you know, that's too, uh, you know, that's a lot.
you're looking at two gigabytes, I guess, of throughput. And you see, you know, there's Scriptaculous, Orbited.js. You know, you've got all of these different libraries that are getting delivered. And if these things were compressed through maximal compression, the bandwidth savings uh, can be huge. And obviously, you know, bandwidth is, is super important, both for cost and for performance reasons. Now, overall, the Google guys report seeing 3 to 8% better compression than Zlib. Uh, and that's Zlib on maximum, not Zlib on fast. Zlib is the library that gets used by most people for doing most of their compression. It can take two or three orders of magnitude longer to compress. And so that's the reason that you don't see this being used, you know, for, for dynamically generated resources, is it takes a lot more CPU. You're spending CPU to get better compression. So for things that are static resources in particular, you should absolutely be using Zopfly. For dynamic resources, probably not. Now, the killer here, is just the fact that decompression speed is unaffected. And for a lot of people, this is really surprising. They're like, well, you know, it takes, a, you know, 10 to 100 times longer to compress or something like that. You know, why is it not slower to decompress? And the answer comes back to, you know, you think about finding your way through a maze, right? Well, if you have a list of instructions about how to get through a maze, the shorter that list of instructions is, the better you're going to do. But at the same time, the complexity of finding the shortest path through a maze takes longer. So when you're doing the compression process, you're effectively trying to find that shortest path. But when you're doing the decompression process, you've just got the set of instructions that gives you the perfect path or the best path that you could find. And so obviously you're actually going to be, uh, you know, faster or in equivalent speed when you're following that set of instructions. And so you're not going to be penalizing your clients for getting this better compression. This is just an example showing that the, the Google libraries, uh, these are, you know, five libraries I found really quickly on Google, uh, showing that they're not yet being, uh, they're not using Zopfly yet. And so I've been giving the Google guys a hard time about this because they invented Zopfly. They should be reaping the benefits, uh, but they're not yet. HTML5 media and font previews are available on the web views inspector. And so if you've got, you know, a font, a web font, a, uh, you know, a EOT or a WAF file that's being used on your website, Fiddler can automatically generate a preview of that content. Similarly, if you've got a HTML5 audio or video, uh, you can see that content within the, the web view tab in Fiddler. Images is another area I've become passionate about for people who follow my Twitter feed uh, are much uh, probably annoyed at how much I tweet about images, but images are super important. And Fiddler offers a huge number of features for analyzing images, depending on the image type. So for JPEG, it'll show you whether or not they're progressive, what level of chroma subsampling is used, which shows you how memory efficient it might be on a device. XF data, so the, uh, the extensible information about the image, things like geolocation and so forth, comments, other metadata. So there's image view inspector tab will show you all of that. For PNG, we show color depth and the number of colors, comments, metadata, so forth. For GIF files, we tell you how many frames were in an animated GIF, what's the delay, what are the loops, things like that. Fiddler supports WebP, which is Google's new lossy or lossless image file format, and JPEG XR, which is Microsoft's new version of JPEG. Uh, these format support uh, these formats are supported in the Image View uh, Inspector within the Gallery extension within the custom columns. So I showed at the beginning how you can have a custom column that shows image dimensions. Uh, so these things are pretty broadly supported throughout Fiddler. Uh, so if you're using those advanced formats, like if you use the Washington Post, the Washington Post website will send WebP images to Chrome, and it will send JPEG XR images to uh, Internet Explorer clients. You can view both of those within Fiddler. Within the image view, the context menu offers things like copy as data URI. So if you want to, you know, put something within your style sheet, a red dot within your style sheet, you can, you know, select the existing red dot. You can choose copy as data URI. It'll put it on a clipboard that you can go paste in your markup. But similarly, you can also copy data URIs outside of, uh, so if you've got a CSS file with a data URI in it, and you're like, wait, is this data URI for the red dot or for the purple dot? 
you can just copy that URI string to the clipboard, and then within Fiddler, you can choose Paste Files as Sessions. And when you choose Paste Files as Sessions, it will parse that data URI and then add it to the session list, so you can then go quickly look at what that content represents. You can extend the image view with tools of your choosing. So when you right-click on the image, you can do things like say, hey, click the tools menu and then have JPEG snoop. JPEG snoop is a JPEG image analyzer that goes very deep into the JPEG format. You can plug that into Fiddler. Or one of my favorites, Riot Optimizer, the, ra the radical image optimization toolkit. So if you've got an image that you suspect has not been encoded very efficiently, you can use Riot Optimizer to go explore and look at, hey, if we, you know, change the chroma subsampling on this JPEG, can we make it way smaller? Or hey, if we um, you know, change the, the color depth on this PNG file, can it get much smaller? Things like that. Fiddler will automatically show image uh, metadata geolocation. So this was the example of uh, John McAfee when he was on the run here. Uh, when we click the find on map link uh, of that picture of, of uh, John back here, uh, it actually just opens Bing and searches the longitude and latitude that were found in that image and puts it on the map. If for whatever reason you don't like Bing, there's a way, a preference to change this to Google Maps. Uh, but you can expose that data uh, very easily in Fiddler. Manipulating traffic. You can automatically rewrite traffic with Fiddler in a variety of ways. The simplest ways are using the rules menu, so you can change your user agent string, or you can remove or apply encodings and things like that. Uh, you can also use the host command on the tools menu. And so this is super powerful if you want to say, hey, right now we, we have, you know, three live servers. We've got production.example.com, services.example.net, and static.example.com. And we actually right now just want to point all of that traffic to Eric Law Dev 1. Well, using the tools, help, tools host command, you can do that very simply. And you can remap traffic in a bunch of different ways. And you can do remappings that you can't do with an actual host file. So in the actual operating system's host file, you can't redirect traffic from one, IP, one IP's port to a different port. Well, within this host extension, you can do that. And so it's very powerful. You can do breakpoint debugging. So this is the type of debugging that people are familiar with with Visual Studio. You put a breakpoint on something, and then you go modify things. And so I want to show this because it turns out that a lot of people, they sort of know that this capability is present, but they've never used it before. So we're going to do a very simple uh, example. Let's clear the traffic list. And then we're going to do uh, BP, B, oh wait, I'm not going to type, break. Breakpoint method, so BPM, we're typing BPM down here for breakpoint method, and we're going to breakpoint on post. And then we're going to go to baden.com sandbox, so this is just the website I have, and I've got a shopping cart example here. And so I'm going to say, hey, I want four of this, and I'm going to click checkout. Well, you can see in the background, Fiddler has broken because it saw a post and said, hey, we're going to break here. And so I can see all of the headers of that request and the values and cookies and whatnot. And I can go over to the text view, and I can see the content of that post. And we see something sort of suspicious here. We see cost field. So this is currently saying 1095 for this Acer convertible tablet. Uh, and, you know, it's been probably a good 15 years since this tablet existed or was any good. So maybe I don't want to pay $1,095 for it. Maybe I want to pay $9 for it. And since, you know, may as well buy out all the stock, I want 400 of them instead of one. Now I can click Run to Completion, and it's going to send that modified request to the server and send back, hey, you place an order for 400 convertible tablets, and they're going to be $9 each, and so your cost is $3,600. So... Hey, look, security testing. We just found that our server is not validating data properly. It's not checking to make sure the data that it got from the client uh, is what is expected, because it should never be trusting data from the client. Now, you would expect that there's no way that any real-world website would be vulnerable to this. You would be horrified to learn that that is not the case. So... You can also do other types of breakpoints. You can do BPU for breakpoint on a URL. So, like, if we want to change, uh, let's pick a reasonable site like Amazon.com. So, breakpoint on URLs to Amazon.com. And we're going to go Amazon.com. Now, say we don't actually want to modify the request. We want to modify the response. So, we're going to click break on response instead. 
And what it's going to do is it's going to uh, run that request, send it to the server, and then when the response comes back, it's going to break again. And so we're going to decode it, and we're going to go look at the contents of that response. And it turns out that they send a whole bunch of white space. In fact, they send a really frightening amount of white space uh, before they actually start to send the body of the page. And it looks like this, uh, when I said a reasonable page, maybe my my use of Amazon.com as an example was not the world's greatest. Uh, okay, so we have a title tag all the way down here, Amazon.com, blah, 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 blah. And we're going to change this to LinkedIn. Dot .net user group demo, and then we're going to run that session to completion. And so what we've done is we've just done a modify operation. Now, we're breaking on all these other things because they also contain Amazon.com, and our, our breakpoint was breakpoint on the URL of Amazon.com. There's a bunch of different ways to resume all these sessions because we don't want to modify them, but the way that we're going to do it is we're just going to select them all and click go, and so it's going to go complete them all. And we're going to go clear that URL breakpoint because we don't want it anymore. Let's just click go again and get uh, all of those guys to go. And so here we go up here. You can see that we did successfully change that demo to LinkedIn.net user group demo. And so we have successfully changed the HTML response. Now, obviously, manual modifications like this are, are fairly time consuming. You, you probably wouldn't do them uh, unless you're actually specifically testing a particular scenario. Otherwise, you would just do an automated uh, modification using the scripting engine within Fiddler. You can do that using the filters tab most easily. You can modify the request, so if you wanted to set the request refer header to something, you could do that. If you wanted to, you know, flag things that had a particular response header or delete a response header or add a response header, you can do all of that from the filters tab, and it will do it automatically. You don't need to set breakpoints, so it works very quickly. Now, I want to talk about API testing now, because that's an area where historically people have been using Fiddler for doing API tests, but they haven't necessarily been doing it most uh, effectively. The request composer is the way that most people do API testing with Fiddler. So there's a composer tab in Fiddler. It allows you to uh, create, you craft your own requests, and then execute that request. There are options that allow you to do automatic Windows authentication, uh, you can do file uploads. You can configure it to follow redirects or not. You can have it crawl sequential URLs, and you can actually even use curl commands uh, within the Scratchpad tab. So if you've got an API that's been described using curl commands, you can paste those in the Scratchpad tab uh, and do those, those uh, tests that way. The Scratchpad tab I want to specifically call out because it's a pretty cool feature. If you're demoing, so a lot of you guys on uh, LinkedIn.net user groups probably present to other .NET user groups and say you want to exercise your REST API. Well, the Fiddler Scratchpad tab gives you a super easy way to do so because you can have within the Scratchpad tab a bunch of raw HTTP requests. You can have them, you know, if it's just a URL, you can just have the URL within there. Or if it's a curl command, so that first line there, curl i, GitHub repros, look for the set of, of issues in the Slick Run project, um, you can have those. Uh, or you can have a fully fleshed out HTTP request, like you see that post there. That's a fully fleshed out HTTP request. And within the Scratchpad tab, when you want to do your demo, you just select whatever it is that you want to send, and then you click the Execute button. And so if you've got a fixed list of steps that you execute to demo your API, you can just throw all of those in the Scratchpad tab. They live there forever. It's kind of like a jot pad. They're there until you delete them. Uh, and it's a great way to show off your API. And so this previously was sort of the extent of what Fiddler offered on its own for API testing. Well, very shortly, we're going to be shipping a plugin for Fiddler called the API Test Extension. The API Test Extension takes the API testing ability of Fiddler to a new level. And so let's go switch over to the desktop and have a look at what it looks like. So within our API test, there's a notion of an uh, a test list. And so a test list is actually just a special form of a SAS file. So we're going to load our GitHub uh, demo. And so 
This is a set of requests and responses. Uh, the responses you don't see, but they're, they're captured as part of the request. And we're going to just go quickly run all these. What Fiddler will do is it will, first it's going to execute a script command before a test list. So within your Fiddler script, it's actually running this and passing all the sessions in. And so you might use this if, you're, if your requests require a particular OAuth token, for instance, or you need to get some, you know, uh, OAuth login and you want to throw that within uh, an HTTP request header. Here's the point at which you would do it. But I've made mine just say, hey, I'm about to run 16 tests. It's not actually doing anything else. And then when I click OK, Fiddler is actually going to go resend those sessions uh, to the server and determine whether or not those things succeeded or failed. And so you can also see, I mentioned earlier, the protocol violations. You can see that session 74, which I believe is, is this one here, the yellow one here, uh, GitHub has a bug where their API that is returning the access denied is not returning the headers with CRLF, CRLF. It's just returning line feed, line feed, which is actually technically a violation of the HTTP protocol. And so it's possible that there's a HTTP client with a very standards uh, specific version of the HTTP interpretation that might fail on that response because they're not doing what is defined by the HTTP standard. And so uh, what you can see is that what it did is it sent all of the requests, and then it applied a validator. And the validator, there's a bunch of different kinds of validators, but if we set the validator for this one, there's code, which is just, hey, did the status code match the one that we got when we created this test? There's body. Did the status and the body match? You can perform regular expression tests against the body. So you could say regex, you know, there's an example somewhere down here. Uh, you can say exact, did, did you find an exact case sensitive string within the body? Did you find uh, that it didn't contain a particular response? Or you could just look for plain text. So, you know, did my plain text appear in the body? If we were to run this here, Obviously, this response is not really going to contain did my plain text appear in the body. And so if we rerun the selected text, it's going to fail. It's going to say, hey, I failed. Um, you can examine the request itself uh, using the examine command. that will show you, you know, it's just a session. It's just got its traffic. It's just going to go look at that stuff. Uh, and so you can see, you know, effectively, uh, you can send any single request you want. When you're creating new tests, you do so just selecting whatever you want. So, you know, obviously we, this is just going to duplicate because we, we already have sent these requests. But if you had a client talking to your service and you captured that traffic with Fiddler or you generated that traffic using the, the request builder composer here, um, you know, example.com, right? We've got this example.com request. Okay, so we've sent that request, and now we want to turn it into an API test. Super easy. We drag it over to the API test tab. You know, we're going to put it in our issue tracking. Uh, we're going to put it over here. And then we're going to say, hey, we actually want a validator. We want a validator that's not to say that the body is exactly the same. You know, we want to change our validator to it contains example.com somewhere in the response body because the site should identify itself. And so when we issue that test, we're going to find that it fails because surprisingly enough, the example domain does not contain the word example.com anywhere within it. And so the API test has failed, and we can go modify that test and just uh, change the validator to, you know, example domain. And this one should pass now because we pick something that is actually in the stream. And so the API test tab is a very super, uh, very powerful way to create uh, either lightweight or even, you know, actually quite intricate tests. And so if you look down here at this labels test, what this is actually doing is it's going out to the project. It is creating a new issue. Uh, it is verifying that the, uh, if you try to create it twice, that it'll fail. It's allowing you to change that, that label. It's going to delete it, and then it's going to ensure that it's gone. And so we've effectively fully tested this API uh, through this mechanism. And there's an after test list uh, script method as well. So you could write a method, uh, you could write a little bit of script that if a test failed when run, it would go log that failure to the database and attach the actual failing traffic. And then you can send that status file off to web dev and say, hey, this thing stopped working, you know, please go investigate that. And so the API test tab is a, is a very powerful uh, mechanism for doing API testing with Fiddler. 
And if you wanted to do load testing or something like that, uh, you can actually import the contents of the API test into, uh, you can import any status file, in fact, into Telerik Test Studio and run it as a load test. Now, Fiddler's validators will not apply, so typically what you'd want to do is you would load it as a load test, and so you'd get 100 virtual users sending that traffic out to your service or whatever, and then you'd run the API test in Fiddler in parallel to find out whether or not that user's requests are failing. There are things that you can also check. You can check to see that there's a regular expression, uh, so you can see that, you know, this is ensuring that the update check service is returning a digit, and then carriage return line feed digit, carriage return line feed, and so forth. You can check to see that the server is returning content encoding gzip so that it's actually returning compressed content. And you can also run functions against every single response. And so if you have a, a business case that says, hey, every single response needs to have this particular custom response head uh, and this particular string in the body, and it's got to be compressed, and some complicated criteria. You can just run uh, any function you want in your Fiddler script. So this one is saying, hey, run the check test function in Fiddler script. And that check test function is going to get the session uh, that was original, and it's going to get the session of the test run, and then it can do whatever kinds of comparison it wants to to decide whether or not to treat that test as passed or, or failed. So I mentioned previously image stuff, super into image stuff. Image optimization is uh, a new passion of mine, and there's a reason for it. If you look at the content on the web today, 62.4% of page weight is images, and 36.5% is everything else. And so the consequence of this is images are tremendously important to the size of page. Uh, mostly JPEGs, but also PNG files and GIF files make up you know, the bulk of what people are looking at. The problem is that most images are very poorly optimized. And so many images are more than 50% garbage. And the reason for that is the tools that designers use, primarily Adobe products, by default, if you do not use the save for web feature, will include enormous amounts of metadata within those images. Well, I, you know, knew this was true sort of in my head, but I wanted something that would visually show that. And so what I created was the image bloat extension for Fiddler. The show image bloat extension for Fiddler, when it's installed, it comes from the Fiddler add-ons page. You can click show image bloat. What it's going to do is it's going to rewrite images as they download. So I'm going to go to adobe.com. It's going to rewrite images as they download, and it's going to draw bricks over them based on what percentage of the image is unnecessary metadata that was meant for the editing tools, not for the end users. And so if we go to the menu and we show all products, for instance, what we're going to see is it's going to go download a page that has a bunch of images. And you can see that some of these images, this image is about 55 kilobytes. And of that 55 kilobytes, 54 kilobytes of it is Adobe metadata that is not ever meant to be sent to the client. So that one was reasonably well optimized. But this guy here, if we select his duplicate session, we go look at the original one. This is a PNG file that's 54 kilobytes, but it has 39 and a half kilobytes of Adobe image editing metadata and a further 12.9 kilobytes of Adobe imaging metadata. And so as a consequence, this image is 95% garbage. And uh, we'll show in the, in the next screen what happens, but just to jump ahead a little, Fiddler has a tool built into it called Ping Distill. And so if we choose tools, ping distill, what's going to happen is it's going to go run this tool. And what this tool does is it strips all of the imaging metadata, all of the metadata that is not related to the rendering of the image, but it's keeping the metadata like the significant bits and the physical dimensions of the image. And then it's going to recompress using Zopfly the image content. So ping internally uses the deflate mechanism, and we know that the best deflator is Zoffly. And so it's going to turn this 54 kilobyte image into an image that is 1.7K. And so we just saved 52 kilobytes of download time for that person, uh, every single person that visits this page. 
And we, in this particular instance, we didn't save a ton with recompression because the image was so small once you got rid of all the garbage. We saved 155 bytes. But very commonly, for images that have been reasonably optimized, using Xopfly compression will save about 7%. And so the Fiddler show image bloat extension is a great way for finding images that have been bloated with metadata. It does not run Zoptly on everything automatically because that would take a lot of CPU time, uh, but that is a feature that will probably make it into a future version of the product. So here's some great examples. On the right-hand side, you can see some ads. These ads, 38K and 48K, are you know almost 50% just useless metadata. Every single person getting this image is getting garbage. Uh, Fastly is an optimizing CDN. They, you know, they their goal is to make your website faster. If you go to their homepage and actually look at it, it's clear that they're not using their product on their own page because they've got 40% or somewhere in here there's like a 90% uh, waste. They promised me they're going to fix that. I showed ping to still. Uh, my favorite example for ping distill thus far is one of the Microsoft properties has this little plus icon. It's a 202-byte uh, PNG file, and it has 49.1 kilobytes of garbage. So it is 24,000% larger than it needs to be because of that image metadata. And so Fiddler helps you discover these things, and with the ping distill tool that, that ships with Fiddler, you can fix those problems. I should also add that you can use ping distill without using Fiddler. You just need ping distill.exe and zopfly.exe, and you can copy those uh, to your automated build process for your website, and you can just optimize your images. Ping to still doesn't do anything uh, interesting. It doesn't change the color depth. It doesn't do any manipulations that could have a visual impact on the image. It only changes the compression and strips the unnecessary metadata. The Google logo you would think is probably the most optimized logo in the world. Well, it's pretty optimal, but they didn't run Zopfly, their own distiller, on on the Google logo, and it's actually 11% larger than it needs to be because they're not using optimal compression. Fiddler's autoresponder tab is perhaps the most powerful feature of Fiddler. Fiddler's autoresponder allows you to play back previously captured traffic instead of hitting the network. So if you've got a SAS file from a customer of a failing scenario, you can load that SAS file into Fiddler's autoresponder and play it back. You can play back exactly the traffic that your customer got to experience exactly what they had happen. Fiddler has a respond for playback mode, a SAS for playback mode in the dropdown. So when you click the import button, you can choose SAS for playback. When you do SAS for playback, it's going to do a couple of modifications to make a customer submitted SAS file playback better, like it will remove all the authentication demands and so forth, because obviously your computer is going to have different credentials than the user's computer. Uh, but the SAS for playback mode is a, is a useful way of doing that. Powering up Fiddler. Virtually everything in Fiddler is extensible. So the red in this diagram is stuff that you write or someone that you trust or someone you work with writes. So you can write your own inspectors. You can write your own extensions. You can write your own Fiddler script. You can drive Fiddler through scripting or batch files. This Fiddler script editor we showed a few times. It's not installed by default, but if you click that Get Syntax View button, uh, it'll install it for you. It gives you syntax highlighting, and on the right-hand side, there's a class view, uh, so you can explore the classes in Fiddler. It has IntelliSense as well. Modifying requests automatically is very simple. There's an on before request method. You can use methods like, hey, does the URL contain ASPX? If so, make it read in Fiddler's session list. Or, hey, is the disable caching rule set? Okay, strip a bunch of headers. You can modify responses in the same way using the on before response method. Everywhere that there's a, a, a call out here is something that you can extend with a script or extensions. So pretty much anywhere you see anything in Fiddler, you can extend it. You can build type-specific inspectors. So Telerik makes a PDF view control. And I said, hey, wouldn't it be neat if Fiddler could natively show PDFs? And now you can. This PDF inspector for Fiddler was like maybe I don't know, probably less than 10 lines to write because it's just a control and it uh, implements the inspector interface and, and interprets the response as a PDF and throws it off into the PDF rendering control. 
You can use script to create new tabs. So that resource integrity hashes thing I showed earlier today is just a relatively simple bit of Fiddler script that is doing the hashes of the response body and then showing that content in a tab. So even if you're not a C-sharp developer or don't want to mess with WinForms, you can do some pretty powerful things. You can also return HTML rather than plain text. And so if you're a JavaScript programmer, you can actually you know, write a JavaScript-based application uh, that interacts with web content that runs inside a web browser control inside Fiddler itself. My goal for Fiddler is to enable to be integratable into anything. So you can integrate it into test processes in a lightweight way by just using exec action uh, or by using your C-sharp code to pass the Windows message to Fiddler and invoke the script method in Fiddler. But more commonly, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use Fiddler Core, which is a .NET class library that represents the core proxy engine of Fiddler. And you can put that inside your application. So if you've got a test harness, a test framework, you can integrate this into the power of Fiddler directly into your app without using Fiddler or any of its UI yourself. It's very simple to program with. You call startup. You tell it what port you want to run it on or leave it at zero if you want. You have the before requests, before response handlers that can modify traffic. You have a variety of functions for saving traffic to SAS files, or you can write your own uh, formats or database calls if you'd like. Um, We'll talk about licensing at the very end. You can power up with extensions. There's security auditors for Fiddler, so you can audit the security of your website just as you surf around. There's a web fuzzer for Fiddler. There's perf analyzer for Fiddler. Somebody wrote a WCF binary inspector for Fiddler. Where are we going next? We want to support Speedy. We want to support HTTP2. We're going to continue to do things in the UI, like the API test tab, that expose the functionality of Fiddler in a way that makes it easier to use. That API test tab is super useful, and it's, it makes API testing way easier, but the code of that tab is probably about 30 or 40 lines. All of the functionality was just latent in Fiddler. But mostly, we're looking for feedback. So you can tweet me at Eric Law, or you can click Help Send Feedback to tell me what you'd like to see in the next version of Fiddler. In terms of our products, Fiddler for PC is free. You can get enterprise support for $9.99 per named user per year. The goal here is if you Fiddler is a mission-critical part of your business, you need answers in 24 hours or less, you might need us to do something interesting in terms of helping you write some Fiddler scripts or more advanced things. Uh, you can basically jump to the front of the support queue uh, by getting a subscription as a priority support customer. For Fiddler Core, we have free licenses for educational use. Uh, but if you want to use it in an internal business systems, it's licensed as a component. Uh, and if you want to do redistribution within commercial applications, so maybe you're building a parental controls filter or something like that, and you want to use Fiddler Core as the engine that implements that, you should contact us, fiddler at telerec.com, and we can help you out with that. My name is Eric Law, or well, my, my name is Eric Lawrence, but my Twitter handle is Eric Law. Uh, I wrote a 350-ish page book about Fiddler. It's available uh, at fiddlerbook.com. We'll give you the links to uh, both the, dot, the paperback and the DRM-free PDF book. I will mention that there's a code right now for the DRM-free PDF, LIDNUG, uh, which will get you uh, the book for, I think it's about $9 now instead of the list price of $15. Uh, and that's the end of my presentation. I've got a question here. Uh, wasn't Fiddler copyrighted by Microsoft as you were working there? How did you bring it to Telerik? So uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, and actually, <laughs> so it turns out I'm writing a book about that. Um, and I gave a talk at the CodeMash conference in January about the process of how Fiddler got away from Microsoft. Uh, the short answer is that uh, Microsoft could have made Fiddler theirs if they wanted to, but they recognized the value of it as uh, to the community effectively uh, and the fact that getting, letting me, allowing a company to pay me to work on it full time uh, benefited Microsoft at no cost to them. And so uh, they effectively let Fiddler go. Uh, and they could have made my life difficult. They chose not to, and I appreciate that. And I think it was good for both them uh, as well as for, for Telerik. Uh, any other questions? It doesn't look like it. Um, can you hear me okay there, Eric? I can indeed. Yep. 
Um, well, thank you very much. Brian's not wrapping up tonight, by the way. He's had to go and deal with a dog emergency, so um, I've had to step in and uh, sort of do the wrap-up. Um, honestly, I've used Fiddler for absolutely hitches. And half the stuff you've shown me tonight there is just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just... You, you know, if I didn't have to go back to work once I'd finished uh, helping away with this presentation, I'd be breaking Fiddler out right now and playing with it. <laughs> yeah, so I would say that, you know, we have some tutorial videos uh, on, on the YouTube channel for Telerik. Uh, there are a couple of, of long talks about Fiddler, but, you know, if you really want to know end-to-end -end, uh, Fiddler, the way to go would be getting the, the Debugging with Fiddler book. I've been doing uh, updates of the ebook. So the API testing tab, for instance, did not exist when the paperback was published, uh, but it will be in the next update to the ebook. So unless you have a central paper, uh, the way to go would be to, to get the PDF. And it covers basically every feature of Fiddler in, in uh, pretty comprehensive depth. Well, I did actually mention using it in the book that I've just finished writing for Sync Fusion. Awesome. Um, I've uh, just written my seventh book for them, which is using Nancy FX. And I do a small section in the book, not much, but just a very small couple of pages on using Fiddler to debug your Nancy FX web API sessions. Great. So, yeah, I mean, it's a great tool. There's just no two ways about it. And it is a tool that we need. Um, what I was extremely impressed to see, though, is I didn't have the first clue that it could load in uh, Wireshark traces. You know? Yep. Um, yep. That's pretty I mean, new. Be, uh, I'm, a, I'm a trained network engineer, um, so Wireshark's basically in my blood. Yep. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's, it's been a super powerful capability. I will say that if you do encounter any problems, send them to me. Uh, because, as it turns out, there's lots of interesting things that happen with, with packet captures. So uh, <laughs> a, guy, a guy sent me a packet capture, and he said, hey, this doesn't import in Fiddler. And the reason that it didn't import properly in Fiddler is that not only did the sequence numbers wrap around the 2 gigabyte boundary, but also he had delayed packets that were delayed by like 20 or 30 seconds. And so Fiddler saw a packet that had a sequence number that was like, you know, 1.8 gigabytes higher than the, the most recent packet that it had seen. And so it's like, hey, boy, this is a really big response. Let me allocate 1.8 gigabytes of memory to fit it. And, of course, that doesn't work. And so if you, if you find any PCAPs that fail, send them my way, and I can continue to, to make it better. Funny you should mention that. I've probably got some somewhere. Um, I don't any longer work for the rather large mobile telco that I used to work for. Um, but during my time there, I um, had a lot of captures from, you know, like web, web and WAP traffic actually within the GSM network. We're not talking about stuff here that's gone over public TCP. Right. We're talking about stuff here that's pushed through the GSM core. Right. Um, via GPT tunneling and stuff. And there's some really funky stuff in some of them packets. Not bad. So I might actually have a look and see if I've got them and uh, dig them out and send you them. Yeah, well, I mean, just try them and see if they import the way you expect. And if, if not, then, then give me a shout. You know? But thank you very, very much. Um, and I do hope that you'll come back and do more presentations for us in future. Um, I'd, I'd dearly love just personally from myself to uh, see a session on writing a plugin or a good script that does something groundbreaking. You know? Sure. I'd, um, I'd be happy to do that. And, I, and I'm sure our members would like it too. And yeah, uh, thank you very, very much for coming along. Well, thanks for having me. It's great talking to you guys. Not a problem at all.